from seismic testing to education to his own re-election in 2020. I sat down exclusively with State Senator Marlon Kinson for the special edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And be sure to download the free Quentin's Close-Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Listen to this interview Wednesday on iHeartRadio. And of course, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Senator Kinson, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. It's good to be with you, Quinn. I appreciate it greatly. I know that it's been a busy season, really a summer for you. What is it like for you to be Senator Kimson these days? Well, you know, uh, in addition to serving in the Senate, which is technically a part-time job, but really full-time, uh, I practice law. Sure. I represent uh, state and local pension funds all across the country. Uh, I also work on uh, big cases, catastrophic inju injury cases, uh, paraplegic, quadriplegic, uh, and wrongful death cases. So I got a number of cases, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, that keeps me very, very busy. Of course, I have two little children. Yes, yes. And uh, despite the Senate and the Law firm job, yeah. my busiest time is with my children. I like to spend as much time with them, and they're my highest priority. That's right. What are your priorities when it comes to the South Carolina Senate right now? Well, um, so this summer I've been meeting with uh, folks in the educational field. In fact, I had a meeting yesterday uh, at Charity Missionary Baptist Church. Um, uh, about how we rethink our education policy, how we keep an open mind to some new innovative ideas that give uh, teachers more flexibility in the classroom and administrators the uh, tools that they need to hire the best and brightest. Um, so we are working through uh, a number of different ideas, not only at a local level, but statewide. Uh, as you know, um, the education was on the forefront of uh, the General Assembly, at least the discussion was, and the House passed a bill. Um, but what I've heard from the people I represent um, is that they weren't uh, um, excited about the House version of the bill. So the Senate will be, uh, they have been meeting, I'm not on the Education Committee, uh, but Greg Hembry out of Ordery is the chair, and uh, what I'm trying to do is educate myself uh, from the people that know the best, that's retired educators and current teachers, Great. so that when that bill does come out of committee, I can make the appropriate amendments. Amendments. You talk about education. I got to take you back up to Columbia. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I know, and I know you're not on that committee or even the board of trustees, but we're going to talk about USC. Mm -hmm. When you think about this controversial presidential search, what goes to your mind? Well, it's a shame that we are politicizing uh, what used to be a very objective, in my view, a very objective process. Uh, unfortunately, the governor uh, has a candidate uh, that he favors in the race and is now trying to engineer the process, uh, which essentially shuts out uh, people who matter. Uh, people including the faculty, uh, administrators at the university, and also uh, students. Uh, you know, um, students uh, should have some input uh, into what they'd like to see in a president. Now, recognize that it is really a trustee decision. Um, people don't want the General Assembly making this decision um, because we will and many want to uh, we got to take the politics out of the situation and get qualified uh, candidates to lead the university it's a big university it's a very powerful institution uh, probably one of the largest employers in Richland County uh, if not the state um, and I just think that there ought to be a formal a process that we stick to and it ought to be very transparent. So it's a sad day in my view uh, for the University of South Carolina in this process uh, that has been uh, uh, muddied uh, by the governor's um, uh, maneuvering. Let me get 
get back over to the, obviously teacher and teachers in education because this was a post Korea headline recently. South Carolina teachers meet emphasize collaborative action action that is in education reform. And I know that you said this quote. Talk to the Democrats and the Republicans. You've got the opportunity to have input in the Senate subcommittee, and we need to hear from you. What do you want to hear from them? Well, that uh, alluded to that earlier. So I am getting out meeting with teachers. That was a uh, South Carolina ed, uh, great organization. They organized a rally before we left over 10,000 sure. teachers and parents and students. Uh, I went out there to hear what they want. Look, I'm a lawyer. Um, and uh, while I matriculated in public school, K through 12, and then went on to Morehouse College, um, I know very little about the best practices to educate our children. And what you don't want, uh, just like the university, uh, just like the university situation, you don't want education being political. And so to me, we need to bring the teachers in, uh, the principals in, and there, there's a whole retired community uh, that has time to work on these policy proposals. After, before I got to the South Carolina Ed meeting, right. I attended a meeting at uh, uh, Alfred Williams Center, uh, where a number of issues of Charleston County uh, were being discussed, listening again to the best practices across the country in this case because they had a gentleman from Atlanta who uh, instructs a single gender education school. Uh, I'm a product of Morehouse, a single gender uh, college, historically black college, um, all male. Um, so we got to look at this thing from uh, all different angles, including including uh, some non-traditional angles like uh, charter schools uh, to find out what's working around the country. We can't get too tied to labels uh, such that we don't uh, have an appreciation to what's working in other areas. Now, sure, we have a lot of good traditional schools, public schools in Charleston County. Uh, we got to make additional seats at those higher performing schools so that the higher performing schools reflect the diversity of this county. Uh, in my view, we can't turn over our best schools to a lottery system where, where uh, we don't know what the outcome will be because we know now that that hadn't always served all of our children. Um, and so and it, it, I think all options need to be on table. On the table, I'm looking forward to hearing more ideas from teachers, more ideas from administrators, community members. Uh, but at some point, we've got to come up with a plan and implement that plan. It can't be a knee-jerk plan where it, 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 it's unleashed in the cover of darkness and nobody knows about it, nobody knows when the vote is. I'm not on school board. I have said that a number of times, and I don't want to be on school board. I didn't run for the school board, but it's incumbent upon me as an elected official to to elevate our education policy in the state house, a policy that has buy-in from community leaders, from teachers and administrators, and, and the way we are going now, uh, they don't they they not endorsing the house plan. Um, and so we got a lot of work to do. Let me get back to USC. You talked about politics, and you did basically don't want politics in education. How did politics creep into this presidential process? Well, I don't know. Um, we got a board of trustees, and quite frankly, it's their responsibility to select a, a president. Um, it's their responsibility to set forth the schedule. It was supposed to be a national search pro process. Um, and um, we, uh, they came up with a list of finalists, um, and uh, uh, you know many people uh, outside the board uh, tend to not be in favor of uh, the gentleman who's the finalist. Uh, so what they ended up doing said they were going to reopen the process, uh, but to call a hastily uh, board meeting uh, in the middle of the summer. Uh, to get the votes necessary to 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 to, to elect one one person uh, seems to me 
uh, smells, reeks of a lack of transparency. Uh, and that may be who the trustees ultimately, this candidate, may be the one that they decide. I just think that there ought to be more notice, there ought to be more opportunities for input, and at the end of the day, as I mentioned, it's a trustees process. I think, you know, where it got political is the governor uh, injecting himself into the process, calling for a special meeting for a vote. Uh, because apparently his favorite candidate has the has the votes. Um, uh, now, sure, the governor should be interested in who are interested in who our presidents are of our state supported in, uh, institutions. Uh, but to interfere with the process, I think, is political, and that's not what uh, we want in South Carolina. Let me get back to what you said earlier about the school board. <laughs> Obviously, you said you don't want to be on the school board. Nope. You didn't run the school board. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of issues going on right now within the Charleston County School District, particularly 75 Calhoun Street. Mm -hmm. What is that one issue that you have your mind on right now? Well, we are, in, and I've said this uh, not too long ago at the Alfred Williams Community Center, I, I think that the policies that come out of 75 Calhoun Street um, have polarized this community. Uh, I, my daughter attends public school in Charleston County uh, currently, and uh, I have never seen more more polarizing time um, in the community where parents are just in an uproar about the decision. Certainly there is a better process to roll out uh, recommendations, uh, and I'm referring to the most recent recommendation that was rolled out with respect to um, several schools, downtown schools. Um, I, I, I just believe there's a better way to do it. Now, it's a hard job. And for the most part, these are committed public servants. I take them at the word uh, that they they have the children's best interest in mind. But it, it, it seems purely partisan. Uh, the board is divided. Uh, there are all kinds of things that go on the school board uh, that you would not think this is Charleston. Um, and so... Uh, we got to slow down. I have a great deal of respect for uh, uh, Chairman Eric Mack, and we have had several conversations. I've been involved with uh, 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 Hollingshed uh, most recently, uh, Kevin Hollingshed at, at his seminar. I uh, saw Chris Collins there. I've had conversations with uh, Coates uh, and all of the newer members uh, to try to pull our ideas together and most importantly be as transparent as possible. Um, we have to work together and it can't be a policy that favors some over others and others over some. We got to try to create a broad consensus and and in order to do that, we need good leadership. You got to have good leadership at a board who can bring votes together. Uh, we're we are in our different political silos, and that's not, in my view, in the best interest of the community. Is this school board transparent in your mind? Well, a number of things uh, call to question uh, whether they're transparent or not. I'm glad to see uh, that uh, they're improving uh, on the Freedom of Information request. I read an ex uh, saw an expose. Uh, by Carter Cole right. of, uh, of the uh, one of the stations right. uh, about now how they're comporting with the law in terms of request. Um, so that's a good step in the right direction. Uh, but when I t talk about a lack of transparency, um, you know, it appears to me that there are a number of recommendations that the people feel like they haven't heard about until uh, time for a vote. Um, now in the Senate we have committee meetings so those are public meetings right. that people can come to and testify right. and uh, maybe the school board holds meetings in public where there's a subcommittee and people are able to testify 
Uh, if I were being accused of being lack of transparent, I would, at the district level, uh, release all of the public meetings we've held on a particular subject before a recommendation is, is voted on so that the public can see we indeed uh, had an opportunity to hear from the stakeholders and vet these ideas. My perception is, and again, this is perception, I have not double checked this with the district office, is that is not occurring. Uh, again, I want to be fair to them. Sure. It may be, uh, but that's not the perception. How many more documents do you want released on the Marvin Yavers case? Um, I think there is a report um, on the Gathers case. I have not read it, um, and I'm not sure where that is. There was a uh, committee at one point appointed by uh, Representative McCoy, uh, and I was not on that committee, so I don't know uh, what else has transpired uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, but um, I think all of the documents, to the extent there is not a legitimate uh, um, privilege that the um, school district holds, uh, should be released. Uh, again, there are legitimate privileges, privileged communications that you cannot release under state law. Uh, but it should not be a blanket. Uh, all of these documents are confidential. Um, my understanding is uh, the report that uh, Mr. Johnson did uh, has been released, um, and I think that the news uh, media has gotten hold of a, a voluminous information. I've read several different newspaper articles on it, um, and so I don't know how much more there is out there, but I have to trust that um, uh, to the extent that there was not a privilege or some other type of objection that's a legitimate objection, um, for the most part, the school district has complied with the request to release information. And also, let me get back to uh, Kevin Hollinshed's event that, you took, that took place just recently. You said this, Dr. Wogan lunch discussion about delivery a quality education to students attending failing schools. Good to hear fresh ideas from Atlanta and other places where the achievement gap is closing. How's the achievement gap here in Charleston? Well, um, as you mentioned, we have nine failing schools, largely in, in Senate District 42, um, bordering on state intervention. All of those schools are in North Charleston with the exception of one. Um, and so some numbers I saw yesterday at charity uh, is that achievement gap is seems like uh, from 19, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from 2016 to today is widening uh, largely based on race. We look at the uh, white or Caucasian students, Hispanic students, and of course at the lowest of the gap, uh, the bottom are African American students. And so we got a problem, uh, and that's why I applaud uh, Brother Howling Shed for having the symposium, bringing in fresh ideas. He and I don't always agree on things, uh, uh, but I think in 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 that respect, bringing in new ideas, uh, he's right on the mark. Um, Atlanta apparently uh, uh, is employing some new techniques uh, like the single gender education, um, focusing on the strengths of students, um, whereas they may be weak in one area, uh, focusing on the areas they're strong, bringing back the technical trades uh, that many students tend to excel in, and, and then there are others who are good at math but not at reading. And so I, fresh ideas is always a good thing. I don't, as I mentioned to you, I don't know. I'm not an educator. Uh, my parents, my daddy was a mathematics teacher and went on to be a principal at Booker T. Washington High School in Columbia. My mama was a uh, Title I reading administrator. So I grew up, uh, and my parents can tell you about education. They're still living today. But I've never taught in the classroom, and I think that we have to get back to the people who know education and uh, follow what they uh, advise us to do accordingly. One last thing on Charleston County, Burke High School. What should that be? What should be their future in your mind? 
Well, um, you know, so the issue there is the dwindling attendance. Uh, and I read a post uh, on social media uh, over the weekend, or it might have been earlier this week, where um, uh, people who live in the neighborhood uh, tend not to send their children to Burke. Um, and so we got to ask ourselves the question, why? Uh, there are many people, including Dr. Barbara Dillegard and others, who are, uh, have been talking about this for some time. And so I hope that we can get a plan uh, that preserves the historical legacy of Burke. There are plenty of good uh, teachers there. Uh, Ms. Swinton yes. is a great, uh, you know, I know her her husband right. you know, attended his church, sure. and uh, I know the, the, the it's a family they live in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so we gotta ex accentuate the positive. AJ uh, Davis, oh, yes. uh, he runs all of the media over there, and uh, just he, interviewed him yesterday. Well, he is uh, he's an, he's really a noted opinion leader on how to do this thing. We ought to go to him and others who. Uh, have a lot of good ideas. Uh, there's no, there's no one solution. Uh, only that we all need to try to get on the same page. We're all stakeholders. We need a good neighborhood high school downtown. Uh, it's a beautiful school, a beautiful campus. I hold a number of meetings there. Um, and uh, I would want to see that school preserved. But I want us, the community, black and white and, and other, to come up with a plan. Now, everybody's not going to be happy with a plan. Um, but that's, that's, that goes back to leadership. We've got to have the right people to uh, engage the community, build a consensus, and then implement the plan and be consistent and stick to the plan. Doesn't mean you can't make tweaks, uh, but we, we got to preserve that school and keep moving forward um, so that uh, our children can attend a neighborhood school. Mental health. This is the headline for abcnews4.com. SC state senators pushing for workers' comp to cover medical, mental health services for authorities. Why now? Well, first of all, that's not my bill. Uh, I got a call uh, from a reporter asking me what I thought about it, and I'm supportive. And so the issue becomes um, we have so many officers and first responders and other uh, 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 people who work in uh, city and state government who have been impacted by trauma whether that's witnessing a shooting, uh, uh, being involved in an altercation, um, intervening in a crisis situation, witnessing someone getting burned. You know, we'd be fooling ourselves to think that you can separate the psyche from what your eyes have seen. And so uh, is there a legitimate diagnosis of uh, post uh, traumatic stress. Yes, we know that that's a, a legitimate diagnosis, PTSD. Um, so, do, should workers comp cover it? Yes. If you are engaged on your job and you witness something that has a traumatic effect upon your psyche, uh, the definition of workers comp is incident or illness arising uh, from the course of your employment. Uh, and so if someone is, is, is saving a family out of a fire or witnessing someone get shot because they're the po police uh, and they have been diagnosed and I think workers' comp on a cover. Where we got bogged down is many uh, in the conservative party um, think that people will be gaming the system uh, for benefits and the insurance carriers are uncomfortable about expanding beyond a physical injury to the, to the mental injury. Uh, but I, I think that those of us who are in the community know that uh, there, there is a legitimate injury, although it may not be physical injury, 
but but mental injury and it should be covered. We're sitting here along the coast and obviously there's some developing news going on. And I know you got this email just recently from DHEC and it basically says this, Senator Kinson, DHEC has completed its coastal zone consistency review of a federal permit application for Western Geico LLC for proposed site mass domestic activities in federal waters off the South Carolina coast. And the department has determined the proposed activities are not consistent with the policies of the South Carolina Coastal Management Program. Seismic testing, not gonna happen right now. What are those policies that are not consistent with the program? Well, I think South Carolina's policy is to have uh, clean water, uh, fresh air, um, and DHEC serves as the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in, in charge of making sure that our, our coast is uh, operating and efficiently and uh, clean. Uh, and so when a company applies for, for a permit um, to do seismic testing, what, what could happen is potentially a disruption to our environment and so we have to be very protective of that because that uh, that's generally done as a precursor to a, a permit for offshore drilling and as a law firm Motley Rice who worked on the BP oil spill we know uh, the devastating impact uh, of an incident uh, that dislodges uh, oil can have off our coast uh, in excess of uh, 50 billion dollars uh, in terms of cleanup and all of the uh, uh, associated economic loss claims uh, arising out of that oil spill and so we have to be very uh, frugal when it comes to granting permits and I'm glad DHEC made that uh, decision in my view it was an easy one we have to be very protective to make sure that our children can enjoy our environment uh, and we can continue to fish and swim and do all of the coastal activities that South Carolina uh, generates uh, uh, enormous revenue from and also the, 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 the not revenue related but the enjoyment of our environment that's that's very first and foremost in my mind. 2020 how fired up are you? Um, so I'm running for your election in in 2020. Uh, first of all, and I don't know if your question deals with me or, <laughs> or the presidential. Uh, well, you can go to president, uh, you. <laughs> well, first me. Go for it. Uh, so uh, we'll 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 refile uh, to run for re-election. It's a pleasure serving uh, Senate uh, District 42. Uh, I enjoy the capacity and. The people have entrusted me with an awesome responsibility. I had a major piece of legislation passed this year that we're hoping generate substantial revenue for the general fund. I would like to see that all go uh, to teachers' raises. What I'm speaking of is we're now collecting uh, the sales tax revenue from internet e-commerce. Right. Uh, that was a bill that I sponsored, and uh, um, you know we talk about pay raises for state employees. Uh, increasing our funding for mental health that's still stagnant at 2008 levels but we got to have some sources of revenue to do it from uh, and increasing teacher pay so I have uh, found a source and I'm hopeful uh, that the General Assembly will move forward on dedicating those source revenues to those areas I talked about we got a great big uh, presidential feel. I'm excited about all of the candidates. As you know, I'm hosting town hall meetings. We just had Vice President Biden uh, attend at the ILA Hall. Overflow crowd. Uh, he did a remarkable job um, uh, communicating his vision for the future. Um, and then we started with uh, Beto O'Rourke, right. who we had at Burke High School, right. um, and he was outstanding as well. He's a younger candidate, but has a great vision um, and just really a dynamic person. And so we've been blessed with the luxury of having so many outstanding candidates. Now, the field, to be sure, is going to be getting narrower. You can see uh, that it looks like the body politic is 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 uh, uh, settling on uh, a few fewer candidates now, um, and so look, it, it's still a wide open race. I know there's a front runner, but that can change 
uh, in, on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, my job is to not endorse any one particular candidate at this point. Quite frankly, I don't think endorsements matter as much as they used to. It's the candidate's connection to the local issues that matter. This Twitter, this Twitter echo chamber, candidates should re resist the temptation to engage uh, and think that's the pulse of a particular community. I think candidates and their staff have to talk to the people on the ground about what impacts them, what they want to hear in the president, what they want to see in the future. And so that would be my advice. Uh, don't get caught up in the pundits on national television and what they're discussing. I talked to a young man uh, who was so distraught about the discourse on Twitter. And I uh, informed a young man that most people in the district that I serve uh, aren't paying attention to, to, to what's going on in Twitter. Very few people uh, that work every day and have families are spending a lot of time tweeting. And I know that hurts us because we tweet a lot. <laughs> but uh, you can get caught up in the echo chamber. But, you know, my response is what the people say in the barbershop. Uh, that's what we ought to uh, we, we ought to be listening to and I go to several different barbershops and check the barometer I run in Hampton Park so um, I see people they stop me all the time and um, you know whether unsolicited or solicited sure. offer their advice and it makes me a better public servant to be among the people go to church um, and people have different issues and a lot of times it's not consistent with what's being discussed on Facebook amongst my small group of friends and, and on Twitter. I got 5,000 Twitter <laughs> friends now, so we're getting a better universe or a bigger universe, but I'm trying to expand uh, my particular chamber. I'm right behind you at 4,000. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll catch up. Uh, you, you'll, you'll catch up. And, and, indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Well, this was great. This was like a primetime live special. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Likewise. Always a pleasure. And I hope to have you back on Quintus Close Up soon. You will. Yes, sir. You will. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir.